On today's show, free agency is now underway, and the Atlanta Hawks, to this point, have been pretty quiet. We talk about what's transpiring around the Hawks, Garrison Matthews, Bruno Fernando, and more on the way. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1511 of the Lockdown Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you deep in the night here on a Friday evening, June 30th into July 1st. And today's podcast is brought to you by the Game Time app. Download the app, create an account, use the promo code Lockdown NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. And please, if you're joining us for the first time or really anyone, make us your first listen each and every day. And check us out across podcast platforms Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, etc. And Yes, for agency is open. It opened this evening, 6 p.m. Eastern time on Friday. I'm recording this a little bit after 11 p.m. Eastern, so I will uh, timestamp things for the last next couple of days because it's basically we're in the middle of madness season. It wouldn't be a surprise necessarily if some news broke while I'm recording this podcast. But at some point, I had to record something, even though the Hawks to this point, again, as I'm recording this podcast right now, have been very quiet. In fact, not even a single rumor tonight. No mention of the Hawks from any national reporter. Uh, it's, It's been very quiet, let's just say around Atlanta in the last couple of hours. But listen, uh, the Hawks have been very much prominently in the discussion for the last several weeks. They already made a pretty big transaction this week. In fact, I recommend listening to one of the five podcasts that I've posted already this week, including a two-part episode talking about the NBA draft hall for the Hawks, Kobe Bufkin, Muhammad Gay, Seth Lundy, et cetera, with Brian Schroeder. I did an emergency podcast with the John Collins trade. I talked to Bill DeFilippo about Seth Lundy and it's kind of more on the Collins trade. I did new stuff. It's been very busy until tonight for the Hawks. So, a lot of things happening around the league. I'll say that. There's been lots of stuff I can talk about forever, but I won't do that on this podcast. Um, before I get any further, though, I'll just say this. It's completely normal and not really cause for concern at all that the Hawks have not done anything so far. And I, Typically, I understand like fans want to see action, and I totally understand that. Don't get me wrong. But um, there's no real, no real reason to be frustrated or um, upset anyway about the Hawks not doing anything in the first five, six hours of free agency. In fact, like the context would tell you that the Hawks have a pretty full roster right now. They can make changes, obviously, but they are pretty full at the moment. They don't have the same kind of glaring needs that some teams do. They're active in the trade market still, which we'll talk about later on in the podcast. And look, if I was betting coming into the night, I would have probably had um, more money than not on the side of uh, the Hawks not doing anything tonight just because they're not really the team that you would circle to do that. Yes, they have the mid-level exception available. They could sign somebody, um, always not a huge name probably, but more of a supporting piece. They could have done that tonight. But generally speaking, a team in in the Hawks spot is probably better off being patient, especially with regard to the trade stuff and see how, see how all things shake out. Um, first options, second options off the board, and then things get more interesting as the weekend goes along and we get into the beginning of July. Anyway, um, sort of the headliner of the night was Fred Van Vliet uh, signing the first true max deal of the cycle, three years, $130 million. You can bet, by the way, I said this on Twitter as well, but DeJounte Murray, who, by the way, shares an agent with Fred Van Vliet, notably so, um, was very happy to see that kind of deal for Van Vliet. You can argue who's better between Murray and Van Vliet, but they are somewhat similar in terms of like the tier of player, like that fringe all-star kind of tier. Uh, Jante made, made the all-star team obviously uh, two years ago, but uh, if you're Jante, you love seeing a number like that of 40 plus million dollars a year for, for Van Vliet at this point in time. Now there were context clues there. Um, Houston was desperate to spend some money. Number one, they're trying to get better right now. Um, Fred timed that very well, but all that said, uh, if you're wondering why DeJounte is not likely to take the, ex- the extension offer the Hawks are going to be offering him uh, on July 1, that is the reason. That's one of those reasons where, like, you know, I talk to everyone that I can possibly talk to, and no one believes that he's going to take that deal from the Hawks. And that's one of the reasons why the market will be uh, probably at least projected to be more robust for him at this point in time. Um, some guys that I thought were potential, I never reported this, but like some like guys that at least they were they're on my long list for the Hawks are already off the board. Just to name a few here, Javon Carter was one that I was prominently interested in. Shake Milton, Josh Richardson, Torian Prince, old pal, O'Shea Brissett, Yuta Watanabe, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, etc. Like, not no huge names there, I understand that. And I, when I talked about the free agency list earlier this week, a lot of the responses were like, well, that's not a great list. I'm like, well, it's, it's not, because mid-level exception or lower is not really going to yield tons of big-name players. Like, a lot of guys moved around tonight, but none, none of those guys that, that were, like, more famous – we're probably going to be realistic Hawks targets in terms of free agency. So still a lot of guys that I would, I would call interesting 
available right now if the Hawks were to use part of or all of the mid-level exception. But we'll see what the plan is in the coming days, how much money they want to spend, and all of that fun stuff. The other thing that is uh, kind of big that we'll get into in a moment is, uh, and by the way, when I use the word big, I'm talking about like for the diehards, like the nuanced people, uh, nothing that the Hawks have done so far is like earth shattering national news by any means, but the Hawks did, did make some decisions on guarantees with Bruno Fernando and Garrison Matthews. We'll talk, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, also Trent Forrest is a name that came up this week in a relatively notable context as well. So we'll get into all of that in more in a second, but first it were from our sponsors on today's podcast. Today's show is brought to you by Prize Picks. If you enjoy the DFS space, check out the award winning app at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. It's amazing. I know that you will love it as well. It's very easy to use. I've been playing there for quite some time now. It's really a breeze to operate at Prize Picks. And at Prize Picks, you make two to six players and then decide whether they actually have more or less certain number of points or rebounds or total yards in football or total bases, et cetera, in baseball. Many more stats possible to evaluate at Prize Picks. And with 25 times the money on your entries, they offer numbers of tons of sports that you might enjoy. The NBA, of course, college basketball, NFL, MLB, NHL, PGA, esports, soccer, et cetera. And a whole entry can be done in just a minute or less. It's that easy, plus it's that quick. And it's just you against the numbers to make it very, very easy for you. They have safe and passive withdrawals, and they're also, also operating in more than 30 states plus Canada at this point. Then on the app right now, go to practice.com, sign up with Data Fantasy Sports right now. If you're a first time user, get 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code LOCKED ON. Don't forget that promo code. It is promo code LOCKED ON at sign up with instant deposit match up to $100. Check it out now at Prize Picks. All right. So on Thursday, the day before free agency began, the Hawks had a deadline to actually navigate. So I talked about this a little bit earlier, earlier this week about Garrison Matthews and Bruno Fernando. They both had non-guarantee deadlines. So basically, if they were still on the roster past 5 p.m. in this original context, they were going to be had their, their salaries for this coming season guaranteed. Um, I thought that both guys, and we, what I said pre the deadline was that I would have picked up both. Um, and I thought there was at least some doubt on both sides. So Garrison Matthews was picked up pretty quickly. Lauren Williams, the agency, had that, had that first in the middle of the afternoon on Thursday. I confirmed that right after that. So Matthews is now guaranteed at $2 million for this coming season. We'll talk about that more in a second. That, that's kind of the very straight-ahead answer. His $2 million salary is now locked in no matter what. The Hawks can cut him, but they have to pay him. That's, that's important to point out. Now, later in the day, on Thursday, the Hawks and Bruno Fernando mutually agreed to push his date back to July 10th. Fernando is uh, guaranteed for a little bit more than Matthews if he were to be guaranteed. It's $2.58 million, so about a half million more than uh, Matthews. In most cases, not all, most cases, a delay like this is not great on the player side. It basically, uh, they don't really have a reason to do that unless the team says, hey, we're probably going to cut you if, you if you don't move this back. It's one of those things that's kind of nuanced, but it's not always this way. But generally speaking, the consensus that I talked to, uh, sort of heard around the league was like, without knowing, it's not great for the player necessarily. It could be different because of how team-friendly Bruno's deal is in the future. We'll come back to that, come back to that in a second um, and where the Hawks are roster-wise and money-wise, but that's notable. Also, in comparison, something to keep in mind, if they were to non-guarantee Bruno and just cut him, basically, they have to replace him with a vet minimum contract. Like, you can't just go without a roster spot. That's have have at least 14 guys. And Bruno only makes about a half million more than the veteran minimum actually is. So you're still spending that money. Uh, that's notable to me. Um, so it'd be very little savings money wise for Bruno if they were to cut him. The Hawks could, in theory, waive Bruno. And then if he was not claimed, and by the way, he might get claimed. He's, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of deal where he's so cheap and interesting to me that I think he might get claimed if he gets waived. But if he were to be waived and cleared waivers, the Hawks could sign him again for the minimum and save like a half million dollars. But anyway, all that said, both Matthews and Fernando are also very team friendly in the future. So without going into all the crazy details, Matthews deal is actually a team option for the 24-25 season. It's also non-guaranteed beyond that. So the Hawks have, at the end of next season, a team option on Matthews. So very, very team-friendly. It's about $2.2 million. They can pick it up, and it's non-guaranteed. Bruno was also non-guaranteed again next year with a June 29th same date, guarantee date, for about $2.7 million. And then he has another season after that that's also non-guaranteed in 25-26, and that's a team option. So both these deals are very, very friendly. That doesn't mean you have to keep them. It doesn't mean it's like an egregious if they cut them. I'm just saying part of the appeal, if you were, at least for Matthews now, and if, if they were to keep Fernando as well, is that they could provide value in the future on cheap, manageable, valuable contracts. So again, I, I've, said, I've said this before. I'll say it one more time now. I would have picked up both. 
I think it's right with Garrison um, just to go ahead and do that. He's not this great player, but he can play minutes for you. He's a good shooter. And he's like a, a very solid, like 11th, 12th man. And that's what he is on this roster. I would personally just guarantee Bruno. But pushing back the date also means that he could be traded. That's something to keep an eye on there. Um, people kept asking me, a couple people did, about like how Muhammad Gay impacts Bruno. I would say it shouldn't really be at all, honestly. Um, not because, you know, long-term they wouldn't potentially overlap. But Bruno, I think right now, is someone that I believe could be like a backup center for a lot of teams. Third center, he's very, very qualified for that role. Um, if, and also the Hawks moved on from John Collins, who could play some center for them. So right now, if you were to just cut Bruno, you have Capella and Okongwu still on the roster as of this moment. And after that, yeah, Muhammad Gay would be your third center, but he's not really a center at this point in time. Like he's center sized, but if you watch him play in college, he's not really ready to anchor defense right now. He wasn't really a rim protector at the college level. Um, offensively, he likes to play on the perimeter. Like I would not go into the season if I was the Hawks. Again, this is me, my opinion, not me reporting anything, but I would be uh, not willing probably as the Hawks trying to win this, this season to go into the year with only Capella, Akangwu, and Muhammad Gay on the roster. I, I firmly believe if the Hawks were to cut Bruno Fernando, which by the way, I would not do, but if they did, it wouldn't be crazy. But I do think that they're going to need somebody that can play some center for them. I'm not saying that he even has to be a center. Like someone like Jeff Green, who isn't a center, but like Jeff Green played center in the playoffs this year. Like a guy like that. Or like if they were to go for like another combo big man. And yeah, maybe Jalen Johnson can do that a little bit as well. But last, starting last year with under, with under Quinn Snyder, they were playing Jalen more at the three on defense than they were at the five. Um, you know, it's it's kind of nuanced, but let's just say you go into the season with Capella and Okongwu and, and Muhammad Gay. If you get a three-week injury for Capella or Okongwu, you're not set up to play like to play like that. Like Muhammad Gay had to play. I'm, I'm, I don't think he's going to be ready to do that. So long story short, I would keep Bruno, and we'll see what the impact is there. Um, I wouldn't panic on anything. I think all these moves are kind of coordinated right now into what everything else is going on with, with the Hawks, but keep that all in mind as we go forward. Um, the other transactional thing for this week so far, anyway, is that Trent Forrest is back in the mix for, for the Hawks. So at the start of the offseason, I talked about this a little bit, but the Hawks finished last year with Trent Forrest and Donovan Williams on two-way contracts. Earlier this week, the Hawks weighed Donovan Williams. He was on a two-year two-way deal. So he was actually still technically under contract, which is why the Hawks had to waive him to have them come off the contract. Whereas Tr Trent Forrest's two-way deal was expiring. So he was already going to be a free agent, but the Hawks... Um, reportedly, this is from Keith Smith of Spot Track. I was later confirmed by me, actually, um, did tender a qualifying offer to Trent Forrest. So for the background there, a qualifying offer on a two-way deal is another two-way deal. So if they're eligible for one, and he is eligible for one right now, he's going to, he's going into year four. This is the last year that he could be on a two-way contract, but he's able, able to be that. So basically, Forrest, as of tonight, is a restricted free agent. So essentially, other teams could offer him an offer sheet, but the Hawks would have the, have the chance to match that. And at the moment, Forrest could just sign a two-way with the Hawks. It's it's, prevent, it's presented to him. This happened last year with um, Sharif Cooper, actually, or two years ago. How, how long ago? ago what, my, it's late in the night. But this happened with Sharif Cooper at one point in time. With the, he, he just kind of signed the tender. Um, that could happen. I don't really know what the Hawks' appetite is to bring Trent Forrest back on a two-way, but they didn't have to tender the qualifying offer. So they, they're always kind of interested with, in, with regard to Forrest. He's that kind of two-way archetype that's not really about upside. Forrest is a guy who's much more lower ceiling but can actually play minutes for you right now. He played for Quinn Snyder in Utah. That's important to keep in mind. Defensively, he is very solid um, to good, honestly. Offensively, um, good decision maker, just not a great shooter. That's is definitely his limitation with regard to all that. But he's not sexy at all. I would say, as far as two ways are concerned, he's overqualified. I would be totally fine with him on a two-way contract. Um, and yeah, so we'll, we'll see what, what happens there. And, you know, the Hawks currently have exactly one guy on a two-way contract, and it's Miles Norris, who they just uh, got out of, out of the draft, basically. So they could use one or two of those spots on Muhammad Gay or Seth Lundy. They could go with Forrest. They could do neither. We will see. At the moment, they have two open two ways. Um, and if Forrest signs the offer sheet, uh, sorry, sorry, signs the qualifying offer, he would be on one of those two ways and they would go from there. So that's the transactions right now. We'll get into it's kind of the other stuff that's bubbling in, around the surface after a break. But uh, as, I, as I've been saying, I'm looking at, the, at my notes right now. It's one of those kind of live podcasts, like just to make sure nothing's happening right now. Still, still clean at this moment in time. So we'll have one more break here to hear from our sponsors. We'll come back and wrap up the podcast in a moment. 
Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. For everybody trying to find tickets to a big event at the last minute, it can be really stressful. Not the best idea for your emotional state or for your wallet. After all, ticket buying should not be a hassle, and it's not with Game Time. Game Time is the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets for sports, music, comedy, and theater. You can avoid stress and starting to for the fun that you're going to have at the event. Plus, they have killer deals and the best price guarantee. Summer is here. There's lots going on around me in Atlanta. I'm sure there is around you as well. And with Game Time, it is really easy to find the awesome deals. Plus, you can also see where tickets are actually going to be by viewing the images of those seats and that protection if your event happens to be canceled. Forget all the money, months of planning in advance. Game Time has deals tickets all the way up to the day of the event. And with the Game Time Guarantee, you'll get the best possible price. If you find tickets in the same section in the same row for less, you'll be credited 110% of the difference with Game Time. It's the fastest growing ticketing app in the country for a reason. You can buy tickets just a matter of seconds. Plus, they'll be delivered directly to your phone to make things easy. Download the Game Time app right now. Create an account. Use the promo code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Use the promo code locked on nba for 20 dollars off download the game time app today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed all right so there was some front office uh title changes and promotions announced by the hawks um not a whole lot of like news here the big one that is kind of i think the most notable and why i listed it first in my tweet about this is that nick wrestler had his job changed. So if you are under a rock, Nick, Nick Ressler is the son of Tony Ressler. He's been in the front office for a while now. His previous job was the director of basketball and business operations. And now he's the principal advisor to the governor. And if you're not familiar with that, the governor is essentially the owner and that is Tony Ressler. So his, his job on paper now is principal advisor to his father, which is interesting. In the real world, I'm not really sure what this title change means, but um, I still think that he's a prominent voice in the room on basketball stuff. He's been around for a while. There was the reporting last year from Sam Amick and others that he had been like a pretty prominent voice in the off in the front office. You don't love that, given that he's the owner's son, but it, it is what it is. Um, many jokes have been made already about the, about all that stuff, but um, for now, I'll just kind of lay it out there. His job changed. He's now the principal advisor to the governor, which is his father. Um, other um, promotions and stuff like that. Um, there were, you know, player personnel moves. Michelle Leftwich got a bump to senior direct, senior VP of salary cap stuff. Grant Lifman, who was once in the media, is now uh, he was actually a pro personnel pro, pro personnel scout before, and now is the VP of basketball operations. Um, Tori Miller, that was actually got uh, announced already in April or reported in April, but she goes from being the GM in College Park to being the VP of player personnel and basketball intelligence for the Hawks. Um, Ryan Silverstein got a bump in title, et cetera, et cetera. So no, nothing huge. I, I tweeted out all of them. You can find those on my Twitter feed. But um, wrestlers the one that's interesting because that's obviously been talked about quite a bit. But this is very normal. Every Basically, basically every year they will um, change titles and a lot, a lot of different people announce that around the summertime. So um, other than Nick Wrestler's inclusion, not, not, not a ton of news there. Um, on the buzz front, as far as like rumors are concerned, rumblings, however you want to say that, um, not a ton going on with the Hawks. Right now, that I've already talked about, Mike Scott of Hoopsite reported, I believe on Thursday, that there is, quote, a belief around the league that the Hawks are open to making another deal with rival NBA executives circling the wagon on DeJounte Murray, Clint Capella, and DeAndre Hunter, end quote. So that's very normal. Still, the Hawks are open to conversations. I've been hearing that they've been on the phone recently. I do think, um, from what I hear, and this is not, I'm not saying anything definitive here, but I think the Hawks are open to making deals and still making calls, and they're very active, but they're not quite the same urgency level now that they have moved on from John Collins. Now they're open for business, but I think essentially, and this is me, this is me talking now. It feels like around the league from what I've heard that because the Hawks are now under the tax line, they don't have the same urgency. So we'll see. They can still change the roster. I think Hunter and Hunter and Capella are definitely available on some, uh, on some level. Jake Fisher wrote, I, I believe a couple of days ago that the Hawks are still making well-known contact with various teams about the other Hunter. So he's still very much out there um, as is Capella. I'm sure in certain, certain iterations, um, there's been a little bit of buzz about Siakam in Toronto. I think Toronto is really interesting right now because they just lost Brandon Vliet, but they also spent on Dennis Schroeder, old pal, as a replacement, it seems like. I'm not sure they're going to rebuild because they also signed Yaka Pertle. And if you're not going to rebuild, you probably wanted to keep Siakam. So we'll see on all that. Um, there have been, I, I saw that Michael Grange, who covers the Raptors up in Toronto, included the Hawks on a list of teams that have been called about, called about Siakam. I knew that already. It's been reported out there. Um, Chris Haynes had reported previously that Siakam uh, was not really trying to resign somewhere else. If he was traded, maybe trying to stay in Toronto. Um, again, 
we'll see on all of that stuff. Also, Kelly Uko, Kelly Uko of, the, of the Athletic wrote about Houston's offseason on Friday morning and mentioned Capella as a possible target. Of course, that's before they signed Van Vliet, so we'll see. But there's been a long-rumored, long-buzzed-about swap between Capella and KJ Martin, who's very cheap in Houston that would kind of give the Rockets their um, center and also give the Hawks a cheaper option as kind of a valuable athletic wing player who is, uh, again, very cheap. So that's something to keep, my, keep an eye on. Um, there's been buzz about Houston trying to get Brooke Lopez. I don't know if they will be able to. And again, keep in mind, I'm recording this podcast like 11.30 p.m. Eastern time. So a lot going on there. I'm not sure if they still want Capella, if they ever did, but that's something to keep uh, sort of noting right now. And last thing, as I check Twitter once again to make sure nothing, nothing else is happening, one more thing here at the end of the podcast is a question that actually uh, gives me something to talk about. So uh, Mac asks, could the Hawks use the mid-level and also get a player with a big trade exception, or is it one or the other? So like a lot of things, to answer the question, with the salary cap and luxury tax structure in the NBA, the answer is that it depends on a lot of other stuff going on. This is kind of on my list to talk about at some point, but it's a crucial point now as well. The Hawks are able to use the non-taxpayer mid-level if they want to. Now, I talked about earlier this week a little bit, but the NBA announced official numbers on Friday. Um, the mid-level is like $12.4 million up to that. Could be less than that, but that's, that's the max that it could be. Importantly, if the Hawks were to use the mid-level, they hard cap themselves at the first apron, which is about 172 in terms of a million dollars. That's over the tax anyway. And so if the Hawks are trying to stay under the tax, then the hard cap doesn't really matter to them because they're going to stay under the tax either way. But before we get the rest of that, the mid-level is not the only way to actually trigger that hard, that hard cap. You can also do it with a sign and trade, et cetera. Um, to answer the question itself, the Hawks could not use the mid-level and take a big salary in the trade exception without going over the hard cap, unless they were to cut salary somewhere else. So, the reason I brought up the hard cap is because, you know, if they do that, the trade exception is after for $25 million. So if they use the whole thing, they'd be over. That, that wouldn't work unless they were to trade Hunter or Capella or something like that. So you don't have to use the full mid-level or the full trade exception amount. You could use a little bit of a smaller amount of both. I heard a rumor. I'm, I, it's not confirmed enough for me to report it, but I heard a rumor of a player on another team that the Hawks have been trying to potentially trade for that would be like a, a mid-level salary somewhere in that range that wouldn't go in the mid-level that would actually go in the trade exception if they were to take a player in. So there's nuance here. There's all kinds of back and forth, and I'll explain that when it actually happens. But I think it's more likely that the Hawks use the mid-level if they don't make any other big moves, which basically allows them to get another player in the mix, could be in the rotation without having to kind of to replace Collins as min- not not like necessarily at the, at the same position, but some someone else that can play minutes for you because they kind of traded Collins for nothing. So they'd be roughly back to 10 guys plus Kobe Bufkin in that in that range if they were to go ahead and do that. Again, it could be a guard, it could be a wing, it could be a four. Um, I doubt it, I doubt it, I doubt it's going to be a center unless they trade one of the centers. But um, keep in mind, like they could really do a lot of everything on that mid-level, which is why I'm, keep, I'm t- intentionally kind of casting a wide net because they could literally sign a player at point guard they can defend, they can sign a wing, etc. So that's kind of the uh, the simplest version of the offseason for the Hawks. Again, I'm not saying this is going to be the sexiest thing in the world or that fans will like it, but the simplest thing they could possibly do basically is to not do any more trades and just use the mid-level, like eight, nine million dollars on a player that they like, and then round out the rest of the roster with the minimums and call it a day. I'm not saying that's going to, that, that, that they're actually going to do that, but they certainly could do that, and it wouldn't stun me if that was kind of all they did. Um, again. The mid-level, not going to be super sexy. I got some responses about that. I understand you're not adding a starter probably with that with that number, especially for a Hawks team. Like, look around at the guys who are signed for the mid-level. They're mostly guys that are either fringe starters or seventh, eighth men in the league. And given where the Hawks are, maybe they could just pull right out of the hat. But I think more more likely, if they if they use a mid-level, it'll be on someone that um, fans are not going to be terribly excited about, but that might, might fill a role for them. Like, I would have thought about Javon Carter, that kind of thing. Um, somewhat of a supporting player. Uh, you're hoping for some defense, if you're, at least in my view, because of where the Hawks are right now. But keep that all in mind. And uh, it's not impossible to do, but the Haw- for a Haw- team like the Hawks, like they don't have a lot of, again, glaring needs at this point in time. They have defensive needs. I'm, I'm talking about positionally. Like nothing screams at you, so you're going to have to kind of win a bidding war or, get, or just kind of wait it out. So it does make sense for the Hawks to be a little bit patient here. The trade stuff is a little bit separate, although it's all coordinated together. I'll, I'll say that always. All this stuff is moving parts if they find a partner for DeAndre Hunter and trade him for a little salary back, they suddenly have a lot of flexibility. If they don't do that, the flexibility, especially if you want to stay under the, under the tax, is a lot smaller. So I've said a lot on this podcast. I'm kind of uh, you know ranted out at this point. But uh, again, I'm signing off. It's 
35 ish Eastern time. And uh, that's all we have at this point in time. So I'll say this before we get out of here. If there is a big move over the weekend, I will do an emergency podcast. Um, if they do something small, like a minimum signing, we'll see how fast I, re I respond to that. But at the very latest, I'll be back with a podcast of, of some kind on Sunday into Monday. Um, I'll be traveling to Vegas in the middle of next week for Summer League. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Summer League is going to open next, in fact, a week from today, the Hawks play a Summer League game on Friday. So uh, between now and then, we'll, we'll be talking about Summer League. We'll be talking about whatever transactions they make. I have a podcast breaking down Kobe Bufkin that I will post at some point in the next week with Dylan Burkhart of UM Hoops talking about uh, basically his full deep dive from someone who covered him at Michigan. And uh, yeah, we have more to come. So please subscribe to the podcast. Tell a friend about the show and uh, really do appreciate all of everyone that's already done that. But certainly I recommend doing that across podcast platforms. Follow the show on Twitter at Lots on Hawks. Follow me on Twitter at BT Roland. Follow my Patreon work at patreon.com slash BT Roland. Thank you very much for staying up, staying up late with me on this Friday evening, everybody. Uh, keep in mind, again, if something happens on Saturday morning, this is that podcast from Friday night. And uh, we'll see you all later on in the weekend or at the very latest Sunday into Monday.